So I'm a historian of modern Europe, uh, 20th century Europe. I specialize in uh, the history of modern Germany, uh, the Cold War, and I have a special interest in the histories of state socialism in Eastern Europe. And over the course of my research and studies, I've also learned a lot about the history of environmentalism in Europe. And because I'm a historian, I'm always looking at the historical context and wanting to find uh, the continuities that persist into the present. So I'm really excited to hear from our three speakers today who can uh, maybe give us, um, uh, I, I'm really looking forward to their perspective on, on where things stand uh, around the politics of the environment as we sort of move into this crisis era of climate change. But before, they, before we get to that, I thought I would give a little context of where I see the history of environmentalism, and in particular, its relationship to the politics of Europe. So it might be surprising for some, but not everyone here, that the history of environmentalism in Europe is not solely a movement of the political left, but has in fact drawn uh, adherence from across the political spectrum since the, since the 1960s when it emerged. Uh, if we go by the standard narrative of environmentalism in Europe, it tends to be um, a movement that emerges out of the political fallout of 1968, as the student movement sort of fractured into uh, smaller groups of movements from women's rights to, uh, we know more famously about the, you know, uh, the radical left-wing terrorist movements. And of course, what I want to talk about today, environmentalism. What really stands out to me, and, and perhaps the reasons why environmentalism could attract people from the left and the right, was that basically, when you look at its origins, you can reduce their view of environmentalism to, on the one hand, a central critique of the state, in particular, capitalist and communist states in Europe, and the ways in which they supposedly treated nature in an instrumental or a mechanistic fashion. And then it's also linked to these other anxieties and critiques about the ways in which the state promoted unlimited economic growth. And so we can see there are a number of cultural artifacts about this sort of anxiety from the 1970s. Uh, I guess Paul Ehrlich's book, uh, The Population Bomb was 1968. There's the Club of Rome's Limits of Growth, Garrett Hardin's Tragedy of the Commons, yada, yada, yada. But why it was important in Eastern Europe was that critiques, uh, environmental critiques tended to focus a lot on communist regimes largely because they saw them as the most extreme expression of that instrumentalist view of nature and that state obsession with, gross, with growth. Uh, and what's really particular about, as you can see, all the ways in which left and right come together to critique communist regimes in this way. So a, real, a really interesting example, for example, uh, is uh, uh, Daniel Cohn-Bendit, the uh, famous leader of the French student movement, who later joins the Green Party in Germany and claimed in the 1980s that he was the most militant anti-communist in the Federal Republic. Or on the right, there was uh, the CDU member Herbert uh, Gru, who rose to prominence in the late 70s after he published a book called Ein Planet wird geplundert, or A Planet is Being Plundered, where he warned that capitalists and communist states were unleashing torrents of pollution that were destroying the planet and threatened to unleash a, wa a, a wave or a, a human flood of refugees on the developed world. Um, there's also the case of the East German dissident Rudolf Barrow, who escaped to the West in the 1980s and urged, joined the Green Party and then urged the Green Party to accommodate uh, eco-fascists within the movement. And supposedly in an interview later, it's debatable whether or not he said it, or if he did say it, he claims it wasn't on the record, but he is uh, more infamously known as calling for a green Adolf who could uh, you know, run a, a new green state in Europe that would protect the developed world from the, uh, you know, the hordes of climate refugees. Now, this is all important because in the 1980s, this movement coheres, the environmental movement coheres around a critique of the communist regimes themselves. And from my perspective, the environmental critiques and the horrific environmental records in Eastern Europe for all of these states actually leads to an erosion of legitimacy for these states. And from my perspective, plays a, a large role in uh, the, the revolutions of 1989. 
for me, though, what really stands out is that because much of the movement or the revolutions of 1989 were um, well versed in the discourse of environmentalism and environmental critiques of communist states, uh, that environmentalist discourse uh, really um, becomes dominant in the 1990s across Europe, but especially in the East. And it makes possible, everyone speaks the language of environmentalism in the 1990s, and it makes possible a whole host of political and economic reforms, some good, many bad across Eastern Europe. And so th that's sort of, so what I see is that sort of like cohering in the 1990s and then continuing to this day. What I'd love to talk about with our guests today is the extent to which environmentalist discourse is uh, how is it being used today, uh, particularly amongst the right in Poland, or I'll, of course, I'll, we could hear examples from the rest of Europe. Uh, where does uh, in a, a right-wing environmentalism fit with the uh, rise of the climate crisis? And how is that playing out in the everyday politics of Poland or, or other parts of Eastern Europe today, if you'd like to, to speak about that? So that's my long, spiel. Uh, but I would love to hear what you all have to say about this. Um, I had, no, nah, it's not really important. Okay. I had something else, a throwaway thought. I will join in as we go, but I think I'd love to hear from our first speaker now, which I believe, believe is Kasia is up first. Yes. Um, thank you uh, for taking interest uh, uh, on environmental issues uh, in my part of the world. Um, I was, when I was preparing uh, for our meeting, I was really thinking hard <laughs> and my thoughts were, um, you know, I'm 45 and I have achieved many wins for ecological movements uh, here in Poland. And I remember a lot from before we joined European Union in 2004. And when I was recalling, recalling on the atmosphere of the days of my childhood and uh, when I was growing up, I remember the, um, the memory of fear. Uh, it, was, it was the Chernobyl fear. Um, it was the, the horrible images of acid rain uh, destroyed mountains, especially Sudeti mountains. You know, we used to have heavy acid rains with sulfur dioxide from uh, from factories back in um, Czech Republic and uh, southern Poland were really causing lots of environmental damage. And I remember scandals uh, regarding polluted rivers and and I remember a lot of fear connected with nuclear power, of course, the Cold War thing. But when I was, when I was putting my, my thoughts back to this time and I was trying to find data, actually, I'm not sure if it was more of a sentimental layer of emotions in my country or was it really discussed in the in the public discourse political public discourse when i was trying to see um like for example old for old issues of um polish news of course i did not do the proper proper um academic research on that but I would need to read your book, Thomas, to fully understand your, your take on my country. But these are just my reflections that I wanted to share. And I also have to um, ask you for a lot of uh, tenderness in your heart because I'm the, probably the worst PowerPoint presenter you will ever get to know. I'm, I'm a born public speaker. Give me a crowd, give me a piece of forest, and then we will have a great conversation, but make me show PowerPoint presentation. And you're just asking for disaster. So let me start 
this adventure of screen sharing, which is not that obvious, but will be a successful one. So, yes, it's not the success. Do you see, is it full screen? Yes, yeah, it is, it is. Perfect, okay. So at least this part of my adventure is... Um, we see your is, PowerPoint, yeah, perfect. Yeah, perfect. and cool. So, uh, you have to know that um, uh, the iron wall times in my, and what I'm presenting here is a lot of my personal sentiment. Of course, I have worked with global organizations, uh, among them Greenpeace, for example, for many years. Now I am with a political movement. I want to become a first female environmental protection minister, and I want to really take care of nature protection here in Poland. But what I'm presenting is not like an academic research on issues. This is what I believe is the reality of nature protection now in Poland. And I want to take you through my very personal view on what happened in history and in our society. So when you go back to the old days before the socialism collapsed, the view on nature is, is kind of shifting between a very romanticized vision of Polish nature. You have to know that we are a very romantic nation. We have our poets, we have our, uh, our art, and it's all about nature. You have forests, you have forests, you have rivers, you have all that. Our poetry is filled with metaphors. So we are very dramatic back at heart and we love our nature, actually. So what you see on this picture is, um, is a design of a Polish uh, country house because spending time in forest was something very common. It is still very common in Poland, but it was like the thing for the 80s, for example, and 70s, everyone went to the forest. We had quite strong nature protection movement. It's called Nature Protection League. Now it's a caricature, caricature of itself. It's very conservative, very far right, but it used to be this great, great organization. We really wanted to have their you know, small logos, they, their posters, very rare, very beautiful. Um, during uh, socialism, we had established many nature reserves and national parks. Actually, a lot of uh, nature protection happened back there. There was a lot of ecological education. I remember being a kid and watching like an hour long um, documents on forests, prepared especially for children. We had our own David Attenborough. He was a hunter, unfortunately, but I remember that um, cool uh, books for kids and uh, a lot of TV for kids, but you have to remember we had like one channel or two channel at some point. So <laughs> when I said say that there was a lot of nature protection in uh, TV, you have to believe me. Uh, but also in the 90s, uh, uh, so after, after um, the Iron Curtain, uh, the Iron Wall were um, destroyed, we had a lot of anti-nuclear protests. We had acid rains. We had a lot of coal mining with a lot of coal mining catastrophes. We had pollution of rivers and air pollution. So uh, there was uh, there were many issues that still needed to be taken care of, and Polish law was kind of reluctant. Uh, we were still we were thinking of joining with the European Union. Uh, so a lot of energy in the 90s were actually put into transforming Polish legal system into the requirements of European Union uh, environmental protection. So um, 2001 is a very important year because first of all, there was this horrible act of uh, environmental protection law that was implemented in Poland. Uh, and this act of law takes a lot of way on local governments regarding establishing any new protected areas, um, especially um, natural parks in our country. 
and 2001 and the introduction of, of this act of law was the last year we have ever enlarged or created a new uh, national park and this is um a very big tension between the state and local governments because in my country in poland actually it's not really uh, beneficial for local governments to protect nature. They get lower taxes, uh, they have many investment uh, limitations, and so far no government was uh, able to change this situation and actually make local communities guardians of our uh, environmental um, environmental uh, heritage but every um every single government since 2001 was stuck with this conflict between what is the state level and the local government level of uh, deciding about nature protection but um and at the very late uh, 90s we had uh, two very important um acts of law that made links and rules protected in Poland. And it's very important because actually uh, we are very separate from majority of countries in European Union regarding our vision of nature. We have the biggest amount of wolves in Europe. Uh, we have um, many, we have, you know, we have our uh, Polish bisons, we have bears, we have, um, other animals that are not roaming free in such numbers in majority of other European countries. So I tell you, this romantic nature of ours um, is very important. What also happened in 2000, uh, WWF entered Poland and in 2004 Greenpeace joined. So you have two biggest environmental NGOs that entered this thing before um there were there were green ngos in poland but they were very local very grassroots and very unfund not not sufficiently budgeted and funded um it was very important in my opinion um to have inspiration from the west um i can tell you that no about conservative and far right we will be talking later so um just to be quick and give you an outlook on what happened regarding nature uh, since 2000, um, as Thomas asked for us to discuss. In 2004, after we joined uh, European Union, we also uh, decided that we would obey EU legislation on environmental protection. So uh, there were two directives um, from European law that needed to be introduced in Poland, uh, the bird and the habitat directive. So these are the major two European Union uh, environmental law um, areas of protection anywhere in European Union and about 20 percent of our territory uh, is protected uh, as nature 2000 area um, and it will prove uh, later on that it was one of the best things ever in my opinion that we actually joined with european union and we had Western societies, Western communities that were experienced in a way that, in my opinion, there was a, this nostalgia after what was already lost in the West. And even if many local communities were unaware of the beauty and the pricelessness of wild nature, um, and they were not eager to protect um, wild Poland. There were, there were actually laws, international laws that could help environmentalists um, to intervene in difficult cases. One of the most important and iconic battles for environmental protection in Poland was uh, the Rospuda uh, case. Uh, you see this river, it's beautiful, it's wild, it's, it's insanely um, attractive just to go and experience this uh, 
a beautiful piece uh, of nature. But um, in the late 90s, uh, there were first steps to actually uh, put um, one of the highways right across this river, destroying uh, beautiful habitats and protected areas and protected species. So there was a big conflict and Poland used its our national laws. Actually, it was possible still um, to take the Rospuda case to Polish judicial system. Unfortunately, uh, peace government, law and justice government um, was very reluctant to actually protect this piece of nature. And the case was taken to the European Court of Justice. And in 2007, uh, Poland lost the case and uh, needed to retreat from the plans of destroying uh, the Rospuda uh, Valley and Polish environmental movement made the first iconic huge victory. It's, it was, I remember, um, I, I never wore, I never went to Rospuda personally. Uh, I was quite um, lonely in my love for nature, in my, uh, in my family and friend system. But I remember uh, that everyone was talking about this case. You had people, you can see snow, they were camping in the snow, in horrible weather, uh, in minus temperature with very hostile local community, but they managed to actually put, uh, put a standard of environmental protection in Poland, that you can use legal system to successfully win victories. Um, then after the law and justice government uh, fell down, we had a civic platform uh, in Polish, it's called Platforma Obywatelska, civic platform government, and we had all your uh, issues connected with neoliberal system, you know, a lot of investments connected with EU money, uh, issues with EU law implementation, especially regarding Nature 2000. There were a lot of issues that needed to be taken care of. Some small issues with the Avogadro forest, um, but there was also um, a very huge effort of Polish government to put into life the scheme on environmental protection on uh, local levels. Um, it's called RDOS, uh, R D O S. So it's regional directors, directorates of environmental protection. And actually, it's a force that is established just to uh, give opinions on uh, new investments, to assess, to support, and to check on uh, potential environmental impact of, um, of um, any new construction that can be uh, that would be supposedly put in, uh, in some protected area or fragile area, or is just big enough to. Uh, influence uh, nature in Poland. Um, unfortunately, uh, the government and no government in Poland made enough efforts so far to actually put wise environmental or especially climate regulations in place. We are the the horrible member of the European Union that still uh, claims that coal can be an option, um, yet we, we, we are still um, trying to get a lot of EU money. It's a very interesting issue to discuss. Uh, in 2015, a law and justice uh, peace party came back uh, to power again, and there were plethora of environmental issues. First of all, Lex Szyszko, Minister Szyszko was this very interesting minister I'm going to tell you um, about. Uh, so we had Lex Szyszko, Lex Developer, Białowieża Forest case, Mierzeja Wiślana, which is, um, which is a beautiful piece of land uh, back our, uh, at our seaside. We had problems with rivers, with forests, with Carpathian uh, forest, with ASF and hunting uh, for boars. Like I could just sit and talk about how Polish environmental and climate protection system 
is getting dismantled since 2015. And it's not only in terms of new acts of law, but for example, we used to have this one over 100 years old uh, board, board of scientists for nature and climate. They were independent. This board was constructed in a way for 100 years uh, that no government could uh, influence what this board was advising on nature protection in Poland. But Minister Szyszko, uh in one of the earliest days of his uh, being a minister of environment again, because as you remember the Roskuda case, it was the same minister. Let me show Minister Szyszko. Um He basically uh, is the face of conflict with European Union, uh, conflict about nature, is a face of using religion and church to support uh, the devastation of nature. Um, and when, when we're going to discuss what happens in Poland, I have a feeling that a lot of, um, of, 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 of conflict in my country is connected with different set of values. So Minister Szyszko is representing this conservative part of society that believes that actually God uh, gave earth and it means also animals and nature, basically anything and anyone who's not human for us humans to use and abuse um, according to the will of God. So uh, Jan Szyszko, Minister Jan Szyszko from the Law and Justice Party made an alliance with a very right conservative. I'm trying to limit my language. Very right, very conservative and um, very um, dangerous um, part of Polish church uh, connected with the center in Torun. Uh, the person who is um, representing church uh, in this alliance with uh, Minister Jan Szyszko uh, is uh, Tadeusz Dedryk, a very dark, um, very dark symbol of uh, many issues uh, in Poland. Anyway, since 2015, uh, we uh, have now the fourth environmental uh, protection minister. Uh, Minister Jan Szyszko passed away after um, a lot of uh, struggles and conflicts and fights and problems and legal issues with European Union. Uh, I'm sorry, I can see I didn't translate the names. I will translate them for you now. Minister Środowiska is uh, just the Ministry of Environment. So until 2019, we just had one ministry for uh, climate and environment then we had a very small break and we just had the minister ministry of climate and kind of everyone forgot about nature protection and then now we have this ministry of climate and environment um but actually uh, there is a lot of mess there is a lot of uncertainty and there is a lot of inner struggle within this uh, ministry of climate and environment Anyway, Lex Szyszko changed the way, uh, change, I, I think that uh, Cecilia will talk uh, more because she took a very active part in fighting with this uh, law. Lex Szyszko is symbolized by this unfortunately fake news photo because this photo of a dead squirrel was taken before Lex Szyszko was introduced, but actually this photo of a, of a dead squirrel in a log tree was became a symbol of um, protests among uh, cities and city uh, cit citizens of, um, of, of cities and villages that were opposing the regulation of um, of logging and of tree removal. You could see um, many beautiful trees falling down all over the Poland, and you could actually see people crying about that but it was just a moment when where poland just became crazy about logging uh down then uh one of the last things i want to talk about is biowieża forest uh 
I hope you have heard about this forest. If not, it's a UNESCO uh, World Heritage Site, one of the a little bit over 200 uh, environmental sites of UNESCO that are protected war world wild. It means that basically, according to UNESCO, Białowieża Forest uh, is as important to humankind as Great Barrier Reef. Anyway, my uh, I'm being sarcastic now. Uh, my favorite minister, Jan Szyszko, decided that this forest needs logging. I'm not going to go into the, uh, the, 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 the arguments that the minister brought to support the claim that uh, the, this forest needs to be logged. Um, the scientists were opposing the minister. Actually, first time in Polish history, so many scientists united and joined with activists and actually discussed um, how um, dis how destructive the policy and the politics of the government are uh, regarding this, uh, this forest. And Poland uh, was not really Polish government. I think they were not ready for the amount of protest for the level of of emotions that protection of the Alavija forest um, brought from people. As you can see in this picture on the lower right corner, you see the forestry, state forestry employee um, chaining uh, environmental uh, activists. All the protests there in this Alavija forest were non-violent. Actually, uh, for the first time in Polish history, you would have, for example, around 800, 1,000 people going to this very small forest in, you know, like some small corner of Poland to march, to break the law because the foresters um, made it illegal to walk uh, in this forest. So it was called the civic disobedience marches. People marched to the forest to claim uh, ownership from uh, state forestry. Anyway, uh, it was another iconic case where uh, Poland needed the legal system of European uh, Court of Justice of European Union. Um, this time it was not possible to fight for this forest uh, in, within Polish judicial system as uh, for now in Poland it is uh, not possible for any local community to actually uh, claim with the legal system any rights uh, to oppose uh, the scheme, the plan of, of, of logging of any area in Poland. Actually, it's another uh, huge case Poland has uh, against uh, European Union. European Union, after environmental movements uh, claimed um, uh, that uh, nature protection in Poland is not really well implemented. Uh, European, uh, European Union agreed and decided that uh, Poland needs to change uh, law regarding um, forest protection in Poland. Uh, you have to know one more thing. Uh, oh, about one third of Poland, of Polish territory, is um, in administration of uh, Polish state state forestry. So it means that these are not privately owned forests, these are state forests. But um, this institution itself has undergone many really drastic changes. And right now it's being taken care, uh, taken over by extreme, not extreme far right, but far right. Um, we have many protests, environmental protests right now. Uh, law and justice government made it very difficult for local communities to organize protests. Right now, for example, if you want to protest against any industrial farm in your area, you need to be an NGO, environmental NGO, that has been registered for all, all, over two years. So it means that there is a lot of burden on regular environmental uh, organizations because they are being asked by local communities to come and help because people cannot even legally claim their rights to a uh, clean environment. And to close up, um, 
on the right and on the left and on the values and on nature and climate. Actually, environmental protection in Poland has been started, has originated within uh, nationalist movements. The most iconic nature protection uh, activist in Poland was Jan Gwalbert Pawlikowski, who was, you know, like probably I would not have many common views with this person right now um, regarding women's rights or LGBT issues or anything like that, except for uh, the love of nature. Um, socialism somehow influenced this view on nature. Of course, the left is, you know, about work jobs, um, at, at least used to be about work jobs. And um, there was this notion of progress that um, was, in my opinion, a little bit um, contrasted with the, with the view on Polish romanticized version of, of, of nature. And for many years, um, actually, the conservative side was not very active regarding nature protection in Poland. And for the last few years, there's been a very interesting movement. And I know because I have also followed this issue uh, in states that you also have uh, young, uh, right, conservative uh, voices, people who are claiming the conservative view on nature and climate protection. So the same is happening in Poland. It's very interesting because these guys are um, connected with this, uh, well, part of Poland that's actually in the government. But when you discuss um, with uh, those uh, young right-wing journalists or conservative journalists or conservative environmental support issue supporters, they feel minimized. <laughs> so I'm always uh, hoping that uh, there will be some connection between how uh, conservative people feel about power they have and uh, the influence they can they can exert on um, on reality. Anyway, I tried to be very short. I'm sorry that I I was not short enough. This was just my outtake of uh, this huge issue of environmental issues in my country. As you could see, there, is very, there was very little in this presentation about climate change, um, because this is so huge that basically 10 or 15 minutes are desperately not enough. You have to know that uh, we are still very cold, de cold dependent as a country. The biggest um, emission, CO2 uh, emission polluter is Polish. Uh, uh, Belhatov uh, plant, uh, electro plant, uh, but our um, government is still not very, we want Joe Biden. I want Biden as a president to come here in Poland and shut down our coal system. Um, and, but there are changes that are happening and it's all about EU, EU budget, EU money and the voices of the youth. Because right now, for the last few years, uh, climate movement also in Poland has grown, uh, maybe not, not to the degree that it happened in uh, Western democracies, but still we have uh, marches on the streets for climate. Uh, Greta Thunberg example was very, very um, strong here in Poland. She was discussed, she was idolized, she was hated. But many things changed. I'm very interested to see how pan the pandemic and COVID situation will influence the discourse on environmental and climate protection in my country. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cassia. Uh, Cecilia, can we pass the screen to you? Okay, now uh, are you hear me? 
Yes, and now I try uh, share my screen. Okay, now it's my first picture, but now I can see you. I need to see you. To make I don't think that we see speech. your presentation yet. Did you try to share your presentation, Tutilia? Yes. Uh, I will see my presentation. No. No, we don't again. see your presentation. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So again, again, share. That's wonderful. And it's coming. And now, it's coming. Okay. Yes. It's coming. Yes, we got it. So we got it. Okay. We see the PowerPoint, but we don't see the separate slides. We see your PowerPoint. Uh, uh, um, interface. Mm, no, uh, not well, on now the slides. Perfect. Now it's perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, hello. My name is Cecilia Malik. I'm an artist. I'm a painter from Krakow, south of Poland. But now I have no time for painting, which I loved. From some years, I organized and eventing happenings, performances, which involved normal citizens into nature defending, which constantly shrinks and disappear from our public spaces. Yeah, it's happenings. And uh, how I became, how I changed the fields uh, from artists to environmentalists, it was 10 years ago. 10 years ago, I made very personal uh, uh, artistic project. It was kind of diary, colored 365 trees. I promised to my friends and to my family that every day I will be climbing on another tree. At, uh, and as a proof that I uh, fulfill my promise, I put picture with Cecilia on a tree every day on my Facebook. I completely didn't thought about, thought about nature at the time. Of course, I love nature. It's very imp important for my private life. Uh, but I didn't thought about uh, that I should to defend the nature. But after that year, my situation won't change because the project was quite famous. I have a lot of new friends, journalists, and also a quite famous Polish environmentalist and city activist. And one of them, one of my new friends from Krakow, who is very good in protect nature by using law, he told me, that our favorite beautiful area in our city, meadow forests around the lake, are in very big danger because Portuguese developer bought this area, and our Creco, our city authority, help developer to make investments there. And he also told me that it is, it's one hope, one very small hope for this area. And this hope, it's small blue butterfly, which is under protection and on European Union uh, uh, and prote um, rare species. So it was, uh, first, uh, it was first time when I uh, experienced using art to uh, nature defending, I organized protest, first beautiful protest. Now I tell to the people that, what, what, what are you doing, Cecilia? I made beautiful protest. <laughs> it's not performance, but beautiful protest. We organized with my sister. In one month, we convinced Krakowians, we convinced normal citizens to dress up, to wear a cupboard, cupboard, butterfly wings and this butterfly wings was a symbol was a symbol of right to the city right to the nature for normal citizen and what is important because it's it's kind of way how i working i give simple instruction for people i give people uh, for people simple um way how they can join emotionally, how they can join 
uh, to nature protection, despite that there are no NGOs, there are no experts. Yes. And uh, it was something uh, quite big. It was one of the biggest miracles in my life because on uh, this green area was uh, 600 people dressed up butterfly wings. And it was different time because it's not, it was before Red and Justice Party. So it was time when we've got independent media. Isn't that it was not correct for political politics. All newspapers showed that protest, and this, that protest changed uh, our city politics uh, connected with this area. And now Krakow bought this area. <laughs> yeah, we got, we also had uh, yeah, from America support. <laughs> But it was a success. We win this battle because our city authority this area and now they built a park for all citizens. And after that action, almost every year I organize another happening, another campaign for nature defending. Uh, I organized big protests to protect uh, wild mountain river. People plating, braiding, very long braid for, uh, for material. I ask people to plate the braid as long as the river to save this beautiful river. And it was time when I start to know river ecologists who are very important now for me. We also support activists who fight for Białowieża forest. Kasia told about that. We in Krakow organized big protests to support them and show that also normal citizens who stay in the city, Białowieża forest are big value and treasure for them. And in 1917, during Red and Justice Party, rule in our country and Mr. Shishko was a minister, I came back on the tree. But it was very sad because half of the tree, of that tree which I climbed up, are falling down because new lectures law. This law was liberalization of cutting tree on private possession, uh, on private property. Poles uh, have new possibility. They can cut tree without any permission and without pay any fees. So Poles go with souls and we had uh, sound of souls everywhere. And in, in March, 2017, every morning I took performance breastfeeding my son on recently logging place. It was very sad performance, which I made every morning, but what, uh, what uh, was the great that after some days, my friends told me, Cecilia, we want to do it with you. We also uh, uh, want to make a protest to save nature for our children because uh, our future without trees are impossible. And in March 2017, we organized performance, only 30 women. We do it what we can. We breastfeeding uh, our babies on very sad landscape in our city. And we didn't uh, know that the photos, this image would have big media success because this image became illustration of Lex Shishko law through whole Europe. Because um, comparative to newspapers, a lot of newspapers show logging trees, but we showed people on this logging, uh, or lo logging trees. So we show emotion. And uh, after uh, this performance, we made a civil movement, called Polish Mothers on the, tree, on the Tree Stamps. 
and moms in another Polish cities take this simple instruction, take a baby, go find a recently logging trees, ask the media and photographer and make a protest. It is Warsaw, it is uh, in Katowice, in a lot of uh, Polish cities. Yeah, it was uh, about the power of uh, image and how art can help um, in nature, nature defending. But uh, cutting trees in Białowieża forest and also Lex Szyszko was very popular in media. Newspapers, left wing newspapers loved that issue. So it was very it was very easy to be in newspaper when you're protecting trees in Poland, because uh, left wing media liked it. But uh, the issue river issue was much more difficult because nobody in Poland two years ago was interesting in rivers issue. The same time when our government start uh, logging trees in Białowieża forest and in uh, cities, our government um, uh, decide to destroy most of uh, Polish rivers because they decide to change our the biggest river into the um, inland transport way. They uh, want to uh, put transport on, on the water. And what is uh, said that we use for destroying a Polish river, European Union money. In one hand, European Union give us law to nature protection. But another hand, European Union also give us money for the de uh, destroying nature. And you know, uh, for me, the biggest Polish treasure, the biggest Polish heritage, it's Białowieża forest, but also almost natural Vistula river. But it's not obviously for a citizen because in past we were poor. In 19th century, Poland was, big part of Poland was under Russian, Russian empire. And later we were, we, during communist time, we also were poor and we have no money for river regulation. So the biggest uh, Polish river stay uh, almost natural. And now it is uh, really, really something because French, German and another European West Europe, they, they haven't no uh, big natural rivers like we've got. But in 2017, they, our government say that we will change the situation and they, we will be regulating Vistula River and also build new dams. We've got on the Vistula River only one dam. One dam uh, which was built by Edward Gierek because Edward Gierek, while communist uh, president, he wanted that river will be waterway for transport, uh, coal transport. And now our go government in 2021 want to finish this idea. So it is this project of New Down. Now they are working on it. Now, now it's battle in Poland for save or destroy uh, definitely Vistula River. And I ask my friend from Polish Mother on Tristam Collective to go into the river. And my task was, uh, was invent the um, social campaign to tell people that our rivers are in danger because nobody knows about that. And I find idea that I ask women to choose their favorite river and to give the voice for the river. The idea was that to rescue Vistula River, another rivers as a sister come to help them, come to save them. And we start gathering women, uh, painting boards with names of the river. In Poland, rivers are female. 
And for the first protest, 100 women gathering together, singing for the river, and say that natural rivers are virtue, very important for us. Now here we are on place where they won't build huge dam, destroying free Natura 2000 place, breaking Polish and European Union uh, law for protection of nature. Yeah. But you know, it was not medial, medieval, medieval uh, topic and no newspaper wrote about us. And of, of course, no public TV uh, showed that protest because TV now uh, are under right and justice party. So next year, we find idea to go uh, with river topic through the fashion newspaper. If normal newspaper didn't write about us, maybe fashion newspaper will take this topic. And we invent fashion for the river. We bought really a lot of uh, recycled uh, swimming dresses and then change these swimming dresses into uh, activist wear. We write sentence about river protection. We embolder it on the swimming dress like that. So all swimming suit was a kind of banner like that, for example, <laughs> say the river. Yeah, and uh, then uh, two years ago, we boating down the whole Vistula River, group of women, women, women with children, boating down to show how beautiful is the river and in big big city we organize fashion show protest as a fashion show and we made quite famous performance we go to minister of inland transport in swimming dress and all, all our sentence and postulate was written on our swimming suit and we also give him a um, document prepared by uh, NGOs who are gathering together in coalition say the river about how natural river are important during climate crisis time and it is last picture I want to show you how beautiful river we still got in Poland. How difficult is that battle? Because this issue is not popular and, and very few group of people know about the plan of destroying river. And now I do my best to spread this information and told, uh, and involve as much people as possible into this uh, protest. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Cecilia. So um, now we have um, Ivona and uh, and I hope that um, then we will have some time for, um, for the questions. So Ivona, please, the floor is yours. We don't hear you, Ivona. We see still Cecilia uh, uh, at the. Oh, sorry. I just couldn't find the button. Uh, okay. Can see the presentation if it's okay. Yeah, it's perfect. Yeah, we see okay. your presentation. So I'm a bit stressed because I know I have to be short with my presentation, and it's really difficult to cut something out. So first of all, thank you everybody that, that you are here, you're interested in the po situation in Poland and we can share our thoughts with you. Um, yes, uh, my name is Ivona Lipman. I teach drawing and painting in an art school, but if I can choose the most important thing in my life at the moment is 
<laughs> educating about uh, farm animals' life, how terrible it is. And as Tom asked us about the politics, I think it will be difficult to talk about politics in my case because I wanted to focus on my um, individual actions and just to look at trends I can see. But what is the most important for us uh, vegans is to educate people just for uh, future voters to choose a proper leaders who can change the law. And uh, yeah, I can go to another. Uh, the mo and also Tom asked us about the differences. So for me, the biggest difference uh, is to have internet and the possibility to connect with other people who think like us. Uh, I'm, I'm really trying to speak very fast and can't concentrate properly, but uh, if I could compare my childhood or my uh, youth when I wanted to act, I didn't know any vegetarian. My family was against me. My friends were against me. All the uh, services or uh, how to say police and uh, other like, uh, you know, um, institutions were against me. So he now at the moment, I can feel we have everything. We can act on so many different ways, but it doesn't mean that it's better. I still have uh, my worries that the proportions are the same, like, uh, Nowadays, we can do anything. We can communicate, communicate we can make uh, actions. But on the other hand, the amount of uh, farms, the amount of uh, production and killing animals is growing. So I have my ambivalent thoughts on, on the theme. Uh, and I put my uh, text here for you to read that this is very emotional, our work. And we have to learn how to separate our feelings from the cruelty we see almost every day. So this is also very, very difficult issue. Uh, I will concentrate on your I will start from the year 2017 when I was more active and it happened after I saw very uh, traumatic picture of a dog uh, being maltreated maltreated uh, by by humans so that was the moment I thought I have to do something now and my only reaction was to sell paintings and get, give money to a specific uh, animal just to you know recover from the horrible uh, memories of that view of that dog and then through these uh, actions i got in contact with a woman uh, who uh, had a dream to uh, open a pig sanctuary in Poland, the first sanctuary uh, devoted for uh, pigs. And here you have two brothers. Uh, you will see them later, how big they became. So it was 2017. And I thought I can uh, paint a picture every day and make this uh, campaign on Indiegogo uh, so we can buy first a uh, home for pigs and a big gate uh, to the to this sanctuary. And uh, through this, I met many people, uh, not physically, but by chat and uh, internet, who ordered uh, such uh, pictures and uh, gave the money. Uh, so uh, here. That was very important moment because that was the, at the this is still the, the most f 
famous peak in the world, Esther from Canada, and uh, these two guys uh, agreed to uh, advertise our our uh, campaign, so we we got more interest and more, I could say, clients for my paintings. Uh, so uh, what's what's the most important of that uh, sanctuary is education. There, I call it like an oasa. I not I don't know the English word for it. It's like a vegan Mecca, Mecca for vegans. And there is many, many people coming and they can see what they ate before, before, like they can see the meat being alive. So I won't be like um, going into details about maybe about more emotional stuff, only will show you the facts. And uh, at the moment, uh, we st they started with uh, six peaks, and after four years, there are 72 of them. And this uh, sanctuary has got 14,000 observers, followers. So the amount of people is still growing, and they are interested in such animal, which before was the most neglected from all farm animals. And actually, there is second uh, sanctuary opening uh, uh, nowadays. And what I could do more, I'm going every summer to paint uh, houses for pigs. I also do uh, gadgets we can sell on the au auctions on Facebook. So I want to contribute to this place. I feel it's like my family living there. And uh, during these uh, times, I was more concentrated on uh, watching what people, what other people do and got to know some of them. So now I will show you some uh, actions, types of actions uh, activists take. This is called Vigil. And uh, this is, uh, how to say, being at the gates uh, of a slaughterhouse, just saying farewell to pigs who will die in a, an hour or a few hours. And uh, the fact of the number made me think so much that, you know, I'm a person, I really don't feel the numbers. I can imagine the number of 100 of one, or 1,000 but when they told me that during three days of work in the slaughterhouse, there are 50,000 pigs being killed. They are uh, exported to China to or other markets in the uh, uh, West. This is one of the biggest slaughterhouse in uh, Europe, in Kutno. The town is called Kutno. So I did these posters and like uh, talking about uh, my uh, actions, also try to put um, as much as I can information on Facebook so people can also get the information. I have many meat eaters in my um, friends on Facebook. So I just had to put all the single pics, all the single lives to see how much it is done, uh, it is killed or murdered during three days. And look here, uh, the town inhabitants, the number of them is less than uh, the number of pigs killed during three days. So that really makes us think what's an amount of killing of horrible things of evil are happening around the world. So here's the picture how uh, how people are saying goodbye and uh, the other the other way of activism is education through social media so we have a lot i'm talking about facebook mostly because i'm active there 
and I could take the pictures from there as they are not private. And uh, here I'm showing you there's a lot of uh, groups promoting uh, eating uh, plant-based diet or being vegans. You can see the numbers are like tw uh, 12,000, the biggest one, 45,000, uh, 112,000. So uh, to I I would like also tell it, to tell you that it's not so bright only the the number of the um, members says nothing because when we put some petitions to be signed there is very very low uh, how to say there there's not many people answering so i'm i don't i still don't understand that uh, there are like we have this uh, peak sanctuary there are also other sanctuaries opening this one is devoted to hens and uh, yeah to get money from uh, running such places they are opening we call it bazarek but i think there's we you can call it like they are making an auctions to to get the money to lead the such uh, places because it there is no help from government to financial help for such um, for such activity uh, so here i put the most uh, important people for myself here is ela mikutska that was the person the woman who encouraged kate from this peak sanctuary to open it uh, and she is really the leader, I think, of uh, activism, pro-animal activism in Poland. She's all very well educated and uh, has a great knowledge on everything was hap what's happening uh, in this context of uh, pro-animal activism. Also, there are people who live with animals like nor I would say like typical people live with pets, dogs and cats. So here is Anya and her partner with two hogs. And here another uh, woman, uh, Ivona, who has the pigs. And maybe this, this one is famous in Poland because this is Pig Lily, who even was presented in TV six years ago, but more like a curiosity, not the with emotion towards the animal, yeah? And another action to educate people about uh, animals being transported alive for a very, very long, long distances without eating and drinking, sometimes for two days and two nights, uh, is action called Animals First on the Second, when vegans don't eat uh, on the second day of the month. Also, we call it, uh, this is anonymous for the voiceless. Uh, in the main towns, uh, they stand in a shape of a square, uh, playing uh, documentaries from the slaughterhouses, um, and just are ready to talk about it with people who want to do it. Um, Yes. Dear, uh, yeah, Joanna, I, I hate to interrupt your presentation, but we have just five minutes left in the hour. And I was wondering if perhaps in this last moment you could um, wrap it up, please. I okay. hate to rush you. I am so sorry. Okay. This is what uh, Kate said about a little about well, how uh, people blocked uh, hunting, but now the law uh it's against uh, activists we you can go to the to a jail uh, for one year if you block uh, hunting there are marches for animals rights there's a new one coming in and uh, uh, talking about european union now we are uh, we are sharing the uh the, the petition to establish a, commi a European Commissioner for Animal Rights. So there are many celebrities uh, sharing this uh, good uh, action. 
I wanted to tell you also about two great women uh, who are advocates for animals and won many cases. Ivona, I, I think that we will have to finish uh, now your presentation because uh, we have uh, we are flexible with time, but it's we will, we will need some uh, some minutes for a question and for Tom to summarize uh, your um, view and your stories. Okay, okay, I will. I'm I sorry. Will. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, I I'll just um. I just want to thank you all for these really eye-opening presentations, and I, I'm going to do my best to kind of put them together and see if we can talk about something in, um, in common. I will just say, Ivona, I love a good picture of a pig. I mean, this is the cover of my book. And yeah, I, I, I saw it. I want to read it, you know? Um, and I, I, I also uh, would just note that we have, even here in Rochester, a farm animal sanctuary. Uh, called Lollipop Farm. And if there is ever a moment when we're all traveling in some sort of normal fashion again, maybe you'll come up here and we can go to Lollipop Farm. Um, so it, here, I'm going to do my best to pull all these threads together. So from hearing these presentations, uh, I think we might be able to identify some trends that sort of tie this together. So on the one hand, since the rise of law, its law and justice party, uh, there has been an obvious and very real effort to not just uh, constrain or undo environmental protection, but also to put limits on the ability for environmental protest to um, push back against the government's decisions. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it also appears that there is a, a growing and strengthening opposition to these efforts. And that in fact, sort of ironically, efforts to sort of suppress environmentalism and to erode environmental protection has produced a fairly strong reaction. So my question for you is, how do you account for or explain um, the way this is unfolded. And in particular, in the case of the Law and Justice Party, the abandonment of environmentalism as sort of a central conceit of all political parties in Poland, uh, is that a result of just this party and the people in charge of it? Is it more likely the, a reaction to a transnational right-wing movement that has been growing over the last decade? And, and because it's transnational, it's being informed and influenced by ideas about environmental exploitation and extraction. And by terms, you could also say that maybe the environmentalist movement that you guys are a part of is that also being produced and expanded by transnational connections through social media and the internet. So is it, in other words, is it should we think about this as a purely Polish issue, which is confined to Poland? Or is Poland like a microcosm of global sort of um, forces that are pushing and pulling against each other and then it's working itself out within uh, Poland? If I may, I believe that, of course, uh, everything is global now, so... Um... You have this tension too. You had a major setback on your environmental protection uh, judicial system and judicial acts and you know um, policies when uh, Donald Trump was uh, the president of United States. And basically, Poland is, I believe, as divided as United States. Um, and this line is about values. But it's also about this. I really, I'm, I'm really struggling to understand, you know, why it was for the law and justice party to start this war against nature, 
what is making like perfectly neoliberal government, well, the, the, the politicians of the previous government that are now the opposition in Poland suddenly become very uh, pro <laughs> environmentally friendly, you know, they are like giving green promises and become quite uh, progressive. Um, Unfortunately, I, I, I think it's not a true green awakening, but it's just a part of traditional war dance uh, between opposition and, and, and the government party. And the thing is that basically, as probably in many places, you have this division on how people see the world. Are we just the primates who are part of the natural order? Are we nature defending itself? And I believe in this uh, view, there is more respect towards future generations, towards um, towards animals, towards plants, towards the planet itself. Or we are thinking about uh, the planet and the ecological system as something somehow distant from humankind. And in Poland, that is a very Catholic country, um, Catholicism and the doctrine of humankind being the top of creation, wiser, smarter, more um, more gifted and believed to be the best uh, species on earth to uh, control other species. And we are talking about quite distant uh, religious uh, strength of religion in Poland. Well, it's, rum, it's, 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 it's breaking uh, and the new generation is not that religious as, uh, as for example, still even my generation, but still Polish church as a whole is not very progressive uh, regarding the issues of climate change and the um, environmental protection issues. There is many theories on that. We are also a society that was devastated during the Second World War. Our elites, our scientists, our uh, artists were in many cases just destroyed either by, by uh, the Nazis or by the Soviets. So majority of our society has um, background from small villages um, where this connection between production and nature was always very hard. Very, It's like your guys out there uh, producing huge amounts of food are not that eco-friendly either and they do need to control nature in their view to produce product uh, to, to make more production and of course we have global system fighting with our farmers we have global system of corporate entities coming and changing the food production and it it also very much in, in impacts nature protection here and we have this huge dialogue between what it means to be polish especially also regarding our culture and what it means to be european and for some reason in recent uh, ecological issues uh, environmental movement, grassroots people were really very often forced to uh, seek support from abroad. Like Cecilia went to Vatican to ask the Pope to interfere with uh, logging in Poland. Uh, I was, for example, I took the seat from the ministry, Minister Szyszko in the European Commission, you know, I, I illegally took over the stand from him and took his mic and uh, warned people in European Union that they really need to help us. So I think that there is also this tension, like the conservatives are a little bit weary about European Union. You know, it's cool to, cool to be in this club, but this club has many rules that are not so cool for Pol Polish rights right now. So I mean, think that there is many layers on that. and. Sorry for speaking too much, and I'm giving the floor back to back to you guys. If I can add something, I'm also very much concerned with the issue of cutting trees, and uh, I don't know what uh, experiences Cecilia has or Kasia, but anytime I phone to the, I don't know the the officers, and I ask about cutting trees, they say, 
the citizens want it. So the people want the trees to be cut because this is the easier for building a nicer way for bicycles and pathway or something like that. There are many, many people who are happy that the nature is destroyed. Quiet. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry for my cat. <laughs> Maybe we want to, uh, if anyone, uh, uh, any of the, the non-panelists want to ask a question, I think now is, is the time. Actually, it might be interesting for you to know that in the European Union perspective, Polish Poland is a is little little U.S. <laughs> we have among the nations of the world, we have a similar uh, amount of people in our society who are climate change deniers, for example. And basically, when I read about your political system, I believe that our political system is in the same clinch between the Democrats and the Republicans. It's yeah. very difficult to make coalitions. It's very yeah. difficult to make progress when you have, you know, such a solid stance. And uh, my country has been in love with your country for so many deca decades, but it's uh, really go ahead, ask questions, see the European version of you. <laughs> I mean, so I, I wonder though, the, what you're describing, though, it seems that so much is is rooted in a. I wouldn't say re rejection of entirely, but sort of the ways in which the failures of the EU's expansion, uh, its inability to bring the so-called prosperity that it promised, uh, has in many ways become codified and so anything associated with that is seen as therefore bad. So, you know, the EU is, is famous for much of its environmental protection programs and regimes. And yet, because of that, therefore, it's sort of like, um, if we're talking about Poland being like America, uh, the right wing in this country has decided that it wages culture war by being intentionally uh, uh, um, contrarian or contradictory. Whatever you like, I hate it. Yeah. Not only do I hate it, I'm going to hate it in your face, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and it leads to really dumb, dumb things. Like they decided two months ago that uh, the left or non-conservatives hate Dr. Seuss, which, you know, I, it's sort of bizarre where that came from. So we had to deal with two weeks of people on the right bleeding about, you know, cat in the hat. Nobody is Nobody is talking about cat in the hat in the rest of the country. It's just them having their own little like spinning themselves into a you know a fury about nothing. Um, but I it seems to be that maybe that's partially what's at the root here is that uh, you know environmental protection because it's so clearly associated with you know the West whatever that means. Uh, therefore, it is to be rejected, or at least maybe that's part of it. I, I'm sure it's not the only reason. You know, I, there's certainly the embrace of neoliberalism over the course of the 1990s and 2000s is certainly a part of it. Um, development, exploitation, you know. Hopefully. Yes, that, but also uh, just the way the system, a nature protection system is set up. You know, with the Europe, after we joined with European Union, there was a lot of funds that went into nature protection. For example, what uh, Cecilia is doing is protecting rivers from overregulation, you know. Uh, there is many uh, projects, many investments in Poland that are uh, made just to use EU funding in a very twisted way, you know. Mm -hmm. So with money comes the need to use the money. So you start building, you start building on roads, you start building on, on, on uh, dams and, 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 and other uh, big infrastructural investments. So. It's that, it's the money, it's also the tension between the state and local governments. Because seriously, for local governments, it's not very uh, 
money-wise, it's not very profitable to be, uh, for example, in the um, nearby lo uh, location of Białowieża Forest or other great places because of the taxes, because the way it's set up, because we have sometimes uh, our infrastructure for nature protection is very divided between many institutions, something that you also know. But what you have in the United States, um, this like um, services that are like rangers that they can actually protect nature. They, as from what I'm reading, they have um, legal system to do that. They carry weapons. They can go after guys who are destroying nature, for example. You don't really have gr good service here in Poland. For example, if a, a wolf is being is, is killed on the road, there is like, so many institution, institutions you need to try to alarm mm -hmm. and the system is very divided. The, law, the, the money is not very evenly uh, distributed. So there's many, many, many underlying issues, but also the new conservatives, uh, the, the ones who want to combine patriotism, nationalism and environmental protection I'm really in love with them because I like to see the many intellectual leaps they need to take to, to make environmental protection very national, mm -hmm. especially when they are talking about climate change, you know, which is very global. So it's, uh, it's, it's really mind blowing sometimes to see the discourse here. I, I, I don't know. Some of the uh, some of that for me is just deeply irrational. You know, right. I don't have explanations. Well, you know, I well, I will say, um, I mean, w you know, we have a you know, our national park system and we have our own regime of nature protection. But I, I'd also say it's n has a very you know complicated history. And you know, some of that stuff, giving rangers guns, was used originally to remove native uh, native peoples. From the land that they occupied in the creation of those parks, but you know, I so I have a question for Cecilia and then maybe Ivona. So Cecilia, what what I didn't understand about the tree removal was it seems like it's one thing to cut down a tree next to the sidewalk or a road, and it's another thing to oppose commercial logging. I just didn't understand why the how those two meet. Um, is it just anybody can cut down a tree in the city now and there's no one to stop it? Or, I mean, we're not logging commercially urban trees. That's, that's not a profitable thing. Or is it more symbolic? Uh, I think it's not symbolic. Uh, it's usually about money when the developer, investor, want to build a huge housing state, first he has to cut trees. Mm -hmm. And uh, in past, he had to pay for it. Oh. After that new law, he can cut it without paying. So uh, it was now they elite regulating that law after that protest. Oh. But it was a small gap of time when Poland go to cutting tree uh, even it was not, not necessary because they thought now we can do it without paying. It's great. Maybe we, we do we will do it in advance. Mm -hmm. So oh. now there are some empty space, empty space without tree waiting for building decision, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This mm -hmm. law make it easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know. Uh, mm. I just wanted to say that actually Cecilia's action made an effect because uh, this that's why this uh, uh, this law was uh, upgraded and you had not only my action I was part of big movement of course of course of course <laughs> I uh, always yeah. join you know with this art I, uh, I organize something which is good for newspaper because it's picture you know but always is connected with many NGOs many wise people who are working with law etc etc. Yeah, I make this visual visual side of uh, that. <laughs> well, maybe this is a, a weird way then to connect to I Ivona, um, which is that, you know, on the one hand, we think of nature protection as a good thing. Um, this is something that we should all be in favor of. But 
a more, you know, more critical history of the ways in which governments and people have used protection of the environment can also find ways in which not great things have happened. So for example, you know, there's work about uh, Israel and Palestine and that there's been this um, reforestation project in Israel that has sponsored the planting of trees across the West Bank. But those trees, this program actually enabled dispossession of land uh, from Palestinians by, you know, we're planting these trees, this land has to be set aside for trees, but it precluded Palestinians from owning that land. So just sort of as a, as a sort of uh, side, uh, an aside, or, or maybe a weird transition, Ivona, you know, when I think of, um, you know, animal rights, which is, you know, a really interesting and I think one of the more energetic parts of the environmental movement. I'm also always curious about the ways in which animals and and you know oppressed or marginal people on the one hand get seen as together, you know, as having a common fate, or sometimes one replaces the other. And so in the context of Poland, particularly in the wake of the Syrian refugee crisis and, you know, well, the long crisis of the, the revolutions in the Middle East, mm -hmm. is there a way, an area in which conversations about animal protection fall into conversations about migrants in Europe? Is there a way in which people can talk about them together? Is there a way in which conversations about protecting animals comes at the cost of protecting people or people who are new to Europe or you know just sort of what I'm thinking yeah I hope I understood your long question sorry I can um, I can clarify I anything that uh, hmm. for uh, like I can, I will tell you about myself yeah because it's the easiest way and I think there are some people with a similar point of view I feel that uh, animals have the same rights like humans. So we, every time on the Facebook, everyone asks me, why you don't help people instead of animals? Mm -hmm. And this is like not the case because uh, we don't want to help people. We want to help animals because there are other, uh, other ones who, whose uh, issues are concentrated on people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not sure if I understood you properly because uh, like people, humans are not the, our case in a way, Hel helping them or giving them the right for something. We want people to respect not the respect the point of view that there is no uh, no right to to take somebody's life either it's a human or it's an animal i'm not sure if i answered no th that's very good i so in the american context so we you know america pioneers these confined animal feedlot operations and mass massive slaughterhouses. Although if you read my book, you'll learn a lot about the European origins of these massive slaughterhouses. But what is true everywhere that there are these massive slaughterhouses is that the people who work in them tend to be the most marginal people in a society. So in the United States, it tends to be migrant workers from Central America. Uh, before, you know, and that, that's true since really the 1980s and 90s. Prior to that, to the 1980s, it was mostly African-American women who worked in these places. Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot of research in the United States. I have a colleague who wrote a book called Porkopolis. He's an anthropologist and he went and he got to observe every layer of production inside this massive industrial vertically integrated facility from sows, you know, breeding sows and piglets, to fattening hogs, to the slaughterhouse floor. And he writes this ethnography where he says that, you know, we have to see the treatment of the animals and the workers in these places as interlinked, and that their fates are very similar in terms of where they fit within the system of capitalist nature. Hmm. And so I'm starting to wonder is, 
have the animal rights groups in Poland picked up on the connection between the exploitation of animals and the exploitations of labor? I, I, would, I haven't seen it. I haven't got any information like that. And for me, there is always a choice. You, do, you don't have this one single job in the world. You always can work in a different industry or Hmm. I'm not sure if I would be uh, if I would have a good uh, opinion on that issue. Mm -hmm. and, uh, hmm. Yeah, it, I mean, I don't, I don't have a good answer and either. I know that in Poland, this is drastically difficult to find a workers in slaughter houses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, in the United States, we have created a system of laws around immigration that make exploitation much more easy. Uh, and it actually gives people no choice. So people who need to make money, who come, come north to the United States to work, they're given these special visas that stipulate that they can only work in specific industries and are there at the discretion of the employer so okay. that the employer gets to decide whether you stay or go. And if you violate, if you, you know, do something to upset the employer, maybe you complain about um, working conditions. I know, for example, during COVID, uh, during COVID that there had been several outbreaks of COVID in slaughterhouses in the United States and also in Germany, I believe, there's this uh, factory system called Tunis, and they've had a similar outbreak. And um, sort of, for me, what I, what I like about, what, what, what I'm thinking here is that these things aren't just particular to one country or another. They are innate to the system of industrial animal production and, and slaughter. And so what I'm doing, and these are you know, ideas that I'm only having recently, you know, in the last year or two, reading other people, is starting to see the fate of animals and people as linked, and as not just linked, but as a way forward. Um, that the next leap for animal rights is to connect the fate of animals to exploited people. And that's, that's, a, that's a powerful political basis or platform from which you could launch, you know, a, a next wave of um, critique and activism, just sort of. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I can t if uh, if I may jump in. Um, actually, I used to uh, lead a campaign against industrial farming in, in in Greenpeace in Poland, and the issue of uh, the the citizens of Ukraine working in Polish slaughterhouses and Polish right. um, uh, procession plants. You know, when you have this. this dead body of an animal and you process it into uh, into retail um in some cases as much as half of uh, the crew of any given installation was uh, from ukraine we have sometimes cases of vietnamese workers also you know, we, we are affected by the same global issues. It's not on the major scale, but we also have people forced from, they were discovered, but it was with the road construction. Uh, people from uh, Korea uh, were, you know, basically uh, slaves uh, forced to work here. So global issues, global uh, mafia, global issues with exploited people, poor communities. Um, immigrants, uh, refugees. It's very difficult for refugees to work in Poland. So this is uh, a separate issue. But I would find this, I, I'm not sure about choices. I try to be very careful about talking about life's choices of people who are not, <laughs> I even have you know enough for privileged people, but especially for people who are not with privilege, I, I believe that it's very difficult to to see the choices and to see the um, the family situation and all that, but yes, uh, not once not now that you mentioned that, there is a link, and also there is this huge shift in Poland that is happening. As 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 uh, not as far as today in the morning, I discussed with um, with a group of farmers who wants to 
propose the definition of um, family farming, like small farm, the definition of this term into Polish legal system, because without it, they cannot really oppose huge international companies and also Polish based companies that are mimicking the internationals who are now measuring in poultry production in Poland. Poland is the biggest poultry uh, exporter in European Union. And it's also, you know, they said today what really resonates with me, resonates with me, like when you have few thousand chicken, you can really see to them even a few hundred, not like many thousand, you know, when you have like a regular farm that used to be reality of uh, many Polish uh, countryside people, uh, you see things, you understand, you feel. They used uh, this, this verb describing emotion. Mm. And it's, it's also, Poland is also this huge shift between the, the structure of ownership in, in the countryside.